Hello, I've decided to make an unscheduled change to the lecture topic for this week. I'm going to do the second part of Tropical Rainforest Dynamics, uh, Gaps and Secondary Succession. In the first part of Tropical Rainforest Dynamics, I talked about the intact understory, the microenvironment and the adaptations that species must have to survive in that understory. So I showed that um, tree species seedlings need to have these adaptations and also species which always occur in the understory and don't get up into the canopy need these types of adaptations. But in this lecture I want to talk about gaps. Now gaps, as you probably all know, um, well, I'll talk about what gaps are. I'll talk about how frequently gaps are formed and how important they are. And I'll talk about how the subcanopy microclimate is modified in gaps. And finally, I'll talk about some of the characteristics that plants need to find and grow in gaps. So, first of all, what are gaps? So, gaps are formed by any structural damage to the canopy from a loss of a branch to a group of trees falling down to the ground. So anything which opens up the canopy above the forest floor. Uh, they are formed by, as I've got, um, anything from a branch falling from one of the large trees which dominate the canopy, falling down and knocking down all the other um, smaller trees and seedlings underneath it and opening up a relatively small gap covering a small percentage of the sky all the way through to a wind burst coming through and blowing down a whole heap of different trees in an area um, which leaves a large gap which may cover two or three hectares. The most common gaps are the small ones from loss of branches and you would get a um, exponentially decreasing curve with uh, the numbers of larger gaps being the smallest. So gaps are f occur fairly frequently. So why do gaps occur? Well trees may shed branches due to disease, wind or epiphyte load. Here's a picture of um, large numbers of tank bromeliads on the branch of a tree. Each of these tank bromeliads may hold several liters of water which can dramatically increase the load on this branch which is not a great thing structurally for the branch and it may break or snap the branch off. Um, however many trees are able to bear this sort of load. Um, so branches may be shed because of disease or wind just shearing a branch off and creating that small gap in the canopy. Trees may also die due to disease, structural damage, wind throw or being overbalanced by epiphytes, being struck by other trees or being pulled down by vines which are attached to other trees. So entire trees may die from any of these different reasons and when a tree dies and falls over it leaves a gap in the canopy. Down here I've got an example of a large area um, which has been uh, where the trees have been knocked over probably due to a wind throw or a sort of like a mini tornado going through this area. These mini tornadoes are fairly well they're not uncommon in tropical areas and where they go through they will knock down trees and defoliate and debranch and basically open up gaps. So gaps occur in tropical forests. There can be a, a variety of size and a variety of orientations. The smaller the tree the more likely it is to die being struck by other trees etc etc um, and when the canopy is open the availability of resources is changed dramatically.
As I said, gaps come in a broad spectrum of sizes and orientations, both of which are important and influence the availability of resources within them. So obviously the larger the gap, the more light, the more moisture, and also on the forest floor, uh, the less root competition there is and therefore the more nutrients there are available at least until the trees grow back up again. Smaller gaps, less light, um, temperature changes less, um, less moisture because the roots are still growing underneath the gap and so on. Orientation of the gaps is also important and I'll talk a little bit more about that later but suffice it to say that most gaps aren't circular they are actually elongated in shape because when you think about it, when a tree falls over, a tree is a big, long, elongate shape. And when it falls over, it's going to take out um, a section of the forest which is elongated or oval or cigar shaped. So a gap may be oriented north-south or east-west or anywhere in between. Gaps which are oriented north-south will tend to get less light because the sun rises in the east and it's not until about midday that it actually shines down into the gap. However, a gap which is oriented east-west, the sun will shine down onto the floor of that gap fairly early in the morning so that it has a longer period where it gets direct sunlight when it's oriented east-west. So, orientation of gaps uh, is important for the amount of resources but size of the gap and the orientation and most importantly the location of the gap is not predictable so we cannot say which part of the forest the gap is going to form um, in the near future now that is very important when it comes to plants utilizing the abundant resources which are released in a gap. There is no way that a plant can adapt its behavior and morphology to find that gap as it were. Okay? And stake it out. Although we'll see some species have attempted to do this. Okay, so how frequently are gaps formed? Well, trees 10 centimeters dBH and above die at the rate of about 1 to 3 percent per year. Um, that comes from the literature, but also from uh, data which I have analyzed from South Trinidad. And that works out to be approximately one tree per hectare per year. So in the background, uh, every hectare of forest will tend to lose one tree above 10 centimeters dBH every year. Now, 10 centimeters dBH uh, is likely to be up in the canopy, but it's not likely that tree is not likely to have a very large crown, so it's not likely to make a very large gap. And it's usually the trees which are smaller, which die more frequently because they are more suppressed and have less access to light than the larger trees. So even though we get trees 10 centimeters dying uh, every you know, one hectare, one tree per hectare every year, it doesn't mean that we're talking about the really large trees. They're, each tree will give a gap which is of a different size and different amounts of resources. How a tree dies is important as well. Trees may die standing up as they quite often do when they catch a disease or they die of old age. Um, if they die standing up the gap which they create tends to be much smaller than the gap that they create if they fall down. If a tree um, does get blown over, 
the gap tends to be much larger. Okay, mostly smaller trees die, so gaps will tend to be fairly small with fewer large gaps. So there's a size class distribution. It tends much, it follows much like the trees. You would tend to have uh, a lot of small small gaps and fewer large gaps. And the boundary between a large sunfleck and a small gap formed by a loss of a branch or something like that uh, will be very blurred. So a large sunfleck or a small gap may be very similar and have similar uh, releases of resources and so on. There doesn't appear to be any sort of correlation between relief or slope of the land and turnover rate or um, gap frequency. Um, so there does not seem to be much spatial correlation uh, between the frequency of gaps occurring and any other landscape scale feature uh, for instance um, a slope or a ridge or a valley bottom and so on uh, different studies in the literature have looked for this to try and find if there are places in the landscape where their turnover rate or the gap formation rate is higher than in others but no correlation has been found there has been some correlation found uh, in a temporal sense or in a time sense gap formation does tend to be uh, concentrated in the wet season or in the hurricane season obviously the wet season is usually when um, trees can be overbalanced by uh, saturation of uh, branches and epiphytes uh, causing uh, different stresses on the branches and it can topple a tree over. Um, also in the wet season you would often have thunderstorms with accompanying high winds which will blow trees over. Uh, I have found with uh, my research that uh, the dry season seems to be the time uh, when trees will tend to die more frequently and particularly a more severe dry season will mean a greater amount of mortality in uh, a forest. Now the gap formation is not likely to occur immediately uh, during the dry season because the tree will take time to drop all its leaves and die standing up and the gaps are likely to be uh, which are formed are likely to be uh, smaller but certainly drought in the dry season is likely to increase mortality of trees and therefore increase the amount of gaps which are formed although the gaps which are formed are usually smaller because the trees will tend to dry, die standing up okay in the wet season, uh, gaps formed more uh, frequently, be also because of the reduced shear resistance of wet soils. Uh, if you've ever tried to bang stakes into a dry soil, you realize it's like trying to hammer them into concrete. You have to wait until the wet season before you can bang your stakes into the soil, and then they'll go in very readily. In a similar way, roots will be very difficult to pull out of a dry concreted soil but they will be much easier to pull out of a wetter uh, softer soil so uh, the reduced shear resistance of wet soils is also another reason why gaps tend to be formed more in uh, the wet season so a typical rainforest has about four to six percent of its area taken up by recent mi gap microclimates. So about four to six percent of the rainforest at any one time will have um, gaps, will be have increased resources because of breaks in the canopy. All right.
So what happens when these gaps occurs? What happens to the microclimate? What happens to the resources? Um, generally, light is higher, humidity is lower, temperature is higher, nutrients are higher, and soil moisture is higher. How much this changes really depends on the size and the orientation of the gap. Uh, this is a graph which I pulled off the web uh, comparing um, the light, the temperature, and the vapor pressure deficit, which is the inverse of the relative humidity, uh, compared between a gap and in an intact understory. As you can see, the biggest difference um, as you go from 8 o'clock in the morning to 4 o'clock in the afternoon is that in the gap you have high levels of light, but in the understory the light is more or less dark and very low. Okay, This light is actually photon flux density. Uh, which uh, is the photosynthetically active radiation, which is the stuff which is important for plants to survive. So, light greatly increased in a gap, and light is quite often the most limiting of the resources that a plant needs in a tropical rainforest. So, these gaps represent a huge abundance of a very limiting resource. So it's no surprise then that a few species have specialized in trying to take advantage of those resources. Temperature, as you can see here, uh, temperature is slightly lower in, um, sorry, sorry, slightly higher in a gap compared to the understory. At any one point in the day the temperature looks to be about four to five degrees higher on average. Uh, the vapor pressure deficit which is a measurement of the amount of moisture in the air um, sorry the difference between the amount of moisture in the air and the, the amount of moisture uh, at 100% in the leaf. So an increase in vapor pressure deficit means that the humidity will tend to be lower and there is a steeper gradient between the leaf and the outside atmosphere. Therefore, there will be greater rates of moisture loss from the leaf. Right, so vapor pressure deficit, as you can see, at any point in the day, well, no, mainly around midday, will tend to be much higher in a gap compared to the understory. It doesn't tend to be much different at other times of the day. But certainly around midday, or from around 11 till about 1 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon, the vapor pressure deficit is much higher in uh, the gaps compared to the understory. So these are the different uh, microenvironmental variables which change with gaps and light is the massively increased resource which is available. Bigger size means more resources, so a larger gap will mean more light, but it'll also mean more soil moisture because the roots of trees surrounding the gaps may not be able to reach all the way into the center of the gap or very far away from the edge of the gap. So that means that those roots will not deplete the water, I'm sorry, the soil of water and nutrients um, so that uh, water and nutrients become more available uh, away from the edges of the gap. So a larger size gap means that there's more area outside of that edge of the gap area so there's more soil moisture and nutrients available as well as more light. Very high light levels
may mean problems for obligate understory species. So species which have developed their leaves in a very shaded, low light environment have arranged the anatomy of and biochemistry of those leaves so that they can operate at very low light levels and they don't need um, safety machinery to clean up um, electrons which are generated from excess light but when a gap opens up and those leaves which are designed for understory um, for understory uh, light capture they will now get a full blast of light and that can damage them because it can quite often mean that uh, electrons are cut loose from the photosynthetic machinery and can go careering about the leaf doing all sorts of damage and this is known as photo oxidation and it can be a big problem for understory species what most tree seedlings do is will drop they will drop their leaves which are specialized um, for the understory and they will produce new leaves uh, which are smaller, thicker and more able to survive in the high light environment. Understory species uh, which aren't not an able to do that will likely die off and will have to recolonize afterwards. But that's only in the very large gaps and the gaps which are oriented east-west which will tend to get the maximum amount of light higher, hum higher temperatures and lower humidities okay so I've mentioned that some plants are, have developed behavior and uh, morphological adaptations which allow them to take advantage of the resources in these gaps. So these gaps represent an available, a huge available pool of resources, particularly light, that are less monopolized by competition. More resources and less competition obviously mean that our selected woody perennials can take advantage so there is less competition so plants which are further down the um, RK spectrum closer to the R end of the spectrum can get an advantage over the K selected species and that's what is that's what happens the R selected species colonize the gap or take advantage of the resources in the gap and they will grow fast and they will reproduce fairly quickly and before too long the K selected species will catch up and they will grow much slower uh, they will quite often only uh, extend branches in from already established trees at the edge of the gap and in doing that they will um, once again capture all the resources from the shorter are selected species and close the canopy once again. So it's in the best interest of these are selected species to find these gaps quickly, to grow quickly, to reproduce quickly before the K selected species uh, arrive or uh, grow tall enough to um, remove them. So what are some of the characteristics of plants which grow in gaps? Um, well, they need to be able to find these gaps. That's probably the most important thing. Uh, as you know, plants find it very difficult to move, so they need to be moved themselves. Uh, so they need their dispersers, and that's why I've got a picture of a nice blue-gray tanager there, or blue jean, as they call it in Trinidad. This guy is a fruit eater, usually found in gaps. They will eat fruits from gap trees, and they will fly around to a next gap, and they will poo out the seeds, and the species will be transferred between the gaps.
So birds are able to disperse seeds. But there are two strategies which these plants can use, uh, these R selector plants can use to get advantage of those resources in the gaps. The first one is a stakeout strategy, and the second one is an early arrival strategy. Interesting. Both of these strategies rely on efficient uh, seed dispersal. So the seeds must be very small and numerous so that um, they can be dispersed widely and they must be numerous uh, so that they can be dispersed everywhere so that at least some of them have a chance of being uh, finding themselves in a gap. Um, in the terms of the early arrival strategy uh, quite often the, the uh, seeds are transported directly from one gap to the next because these birds and animals which eat the gap fruits will preferentially search out the gaps to be able to uh, eat the resources, um, the fruits and so on which are available in that gap. Okay, and those fruits and uh, flowers and new leaves and so on which are available in the gap are only there because these R selected species can efficiently use the abundant resources. So um, I haven't really described the stakeout and the early arrival strategies have I? Okay first of all this, the early arrival strategies is pretty much as I um, described what the early arrival strategy uh, tries to do is uh, in a um, in a gap uh, animals will be enticed with fruits they will eat the fruits which contains many and abundant small seeds of the um, the plant in question and that animal will then go in search of another gap to, to get more fruits and when it arrives in the next gap it will poo out the seeds that it ate in the previous gap and in so doing uh, transfer the seeds from a high resource environment to a next high resource environment and so spread the species throughout all the high um, resource environments. Hopefully the seeds will arrive early enough so that their resources are enough resources are still available for it to germinate and grow quickly and reproduce quickly. The second strategy is the stakeout strategy. And this strategy relies on the seeds being very small and numerous but being distributed uh, evenly across the landscape where there are gaps and where there are no gaps. So that there is seeds of these R selected species present in the soils of all this rainforest so that even in the deepest darkest understory there will be seeds of these R selected species contained in the soil but these seeds will remain dormant they won't germinate and they won't grow until they detect a change in the red far red ratio which means that a gap has opened up above them and there is abundant light and nutrients for them to use at that time they will germinate and they will begin to grow and utilize the abundant resources so the stakeout strategy the species uh, spreads its seeds throughout the forest where there are gaps and where there are no gaps and when a gap does form at some time then the seeds will be able to germinate and grow and complete their life cycle. So two strategies, the stakeout strategy and the early arrival strategy. Some of the classic R strategists are Cecropias or Boacanos, you recognize those leaves. Here are the fruits of Cecropias. 
they are very tasty to birds and birds um, eat them a lot and bats as well and they will take them and disperse them across the landscape. Uh, pipers uh, or candlestick bushes they are called in Trinidad are very much adapted to this type of um, our selected life cycle as well. Uh, bats will take these prominently displayed fruits which stick up above the, the main canopy of the plant so the bats can just fly in and grab them and take them away. Uh, if you have ever had bats in your house uh, you'll see that they drop a lot of these um, fruiting bodies from the pipers or candlestick bushes on the floor and uh, if you look at the shit which they leave on the walls it usually has loads of the seeds of this plant packed within it. So bats, birds, also animals as well and when it comes to silk cotton and cedar trees wind is the main disperser in that case. So these uh, our strategists have the same um, characteristic in that they have small numerous seeds which are easily dispersed across the landscape some of which will find a gap immediately if they are targeted by the um, if they are targeted by the disperser going to a next gap or they will lie in the understory in wait they will stake out a gap and they will germinate and grow when the gap arrives all right so there are some characteristics of the plants so these are selected plants which grow in gaps high growth rates because they occur only in areas with abundant resources and in particular abundant light they have uh, very high growth rates and they have photosynthetic systems to maximize the uptake of light so they will tend to have large thin leaves with um, chlorophyll no they actually have very quite large leaves to maximize uptake but the leaves are relatively thick okay with the chlorophyll arranged um, not in one plane but stacked so that light passing through the leaf will not only be taken up by the first level but they'll be taken up by the second and third and fourth level as well so in that way the plant can maximize the amount of resources which are taken up these plants um, are therefore able to utilize very high light levels photosynthetic uh, the photosynthetic machinery is not easily saturated or or topped off uh, so it can just keep on going up as the light levels increase uh, if you contrast that with uh, the understory plants they are rapidly saturated by high light levels which they never encounter in the understory in a tropical rainforest these are selected species and not going to be annuals they will need um, some initial growth of biomass to get them away from maybe vines and uh, other uh, seedlings which are already present in the gap before the gap was formed and those are usually the case selected species which are just hanging out in the gap where hanging out on the forest floor waiting for a gap to occur so these seedlings are quite often going to be a meter or so in height and uh, the R selected species need to grow uh, quickly to get above those uh, seedlings uh, initially so there will be some initial growth in biomass um, these R selected species will quite often live for about five to ten years as well so they're quite long-lived when it comes to our selected species they're most certainly not annuals they are perennials and they can reproduce repeatedly but if we contrast that lifespan of ten years can compare that to the lifespan of a case selected species which may be a hundred hundreds of years 
then obviously you can see the R selected species are shorter, li shorter lived and they will reproduce much, much quicker. So reprodu reproduction occurs relatively early because of the higher light levels. The greater amount of resources and energy around means that uh, the plant can grow to the minimum size that it needs to be to capture the, ma the amount of energy that it needs to reproduce. It'll reach that size very quickly. It'll get that uh, triggering amount of uh, energy and then it will start flowering and fruiting. So if the, canop if the gap is larger then that will quite often occur earlier than if the gap is smaller. If the gap is smaller then the gap stage species or the R selected species uh, will take longer to uh, reach the size where it gets enough energy to start flowering and fruiting. And in some very small gaps uh, which nevertheless provoke the germination of R selected seeds the seedlings of these R selected species may never get big enough and they will die before they're able to reproduce. But the uh, detection of the gaps through red far red ratio is quite often not fooled by that. So uh, these R selected species will only germinate when there is a gap. So what happens to the K selected species in all of these? Well, I mentioned them before. Uh, K-selected species uh, don't need um, high resources to survive. They're a fairly, fairly competitive, so they're quite often present as seedlings on the forest floor, and a gap will open up above them. Quite often they're not able to grow very fast because they simply don't have the uh, physiological adaptations to do that. They can't grow as fast as the R selected species. Their um, photosynthetic systems for instance are very easily saturated so they can't take up as much energy so they grow will tend to grow slower. But they will grow um, more than, than if a gap had not opened up above them. Essentially they are waiting for a gap. Many of the species are waiting for a gap. And if they don't get a gap, then they won't grow any taller and they will increase the chance that they will die through disease or being um, crushed by a falling branch or something. So these case selected species hang out in the understories as seedlings. If a gap opens up above them, they will grow faster they won't grow as fast as the R selected species, but they will be able to grow um, and add on maybe two or three uh, meters before the gap closes up once again. It's usually not enough to get to the reproductive stage for these K selected species. In other words, they haven't reached the canopy as yet. And a seedling and a sapling may need to go through several gaps, maybe three or four gaps, before they're, they are large enough to get their leaves into the canopy and start uh, reproducing. But as the case selected species gets bigger and bigger, it gets into a higher and higher light zone and so it is able to capture more and more energy and therefore grow larger and larger until it finally reaches the point where it gets enough energy for reproduction. But these are selected species, they preferentially search out the areas with high light, so there is enough light for them to grow very with high growth rates and to reproduce very early. So that is the lecture for Gap Dynamics, number two. Uh, thank you very much for listening.